Hi, I'm Will Adams, and this is Honeybrook Tools and Woodworks. This afternoon, I am going to do the first in a series of videos that I do introducing you to the various tools that I make here in the shop. And first up today are the Honeybrook winding sticks. I've got a pair in Curly Koa that I'm going to be making this afternoon. Um, I make them in a lot of different um, combinations. Here's a set um, of maple with hunter and mahogany siding inlays. Uh, I make them with tiger maple and ebony. Uh, all the combinations are on my website at honeybrookstools.com. This isn't so much an instructional video in how to make winding sticks as much as it is kind of a peek into my process and what I think about and what goes into um, how I make mine. So, um, today I'm working with a piece of curly koa that's absolutely stunning. Let's dive into it and see how it goes. Hey, I'm in the shop this afternoon getting ready to make a pair of winding sticks with this beautiful piece of curly koa. And I thought I'd just kind of walk through some of the first steps that I go through each time that I make a set of winding sticks. As I have mentioned in other videos, all my winding sticks are used with either uh, preferably quarter sawn or riff sawn um, timber. Flat sawn is just not dimensionally stable enough. Um, so I just, I, all my stock that I buy is going to be either quarter sawn or riff sawn. And this is um, closer to riff sawn than it is quarter sawn. But that's fine. Uh, it's about four and a half inches wide. And my sticks tend to be two inches tall. And I say tend to be because uh, if they need to be a little bit shorter than that, and I've got a nice piece of wood that I want to use, an eighth of an inch uh, isn't going to make a difference. So anyway, um, when I look at this, I got I need to figure out, okay, um, is there any waste that I want to get rid of? Um, personally, I kind of like this character. Uh, there's a little bit of um, spalting down here. I kind of like that. Um, but I don't know that everybody would. So since these, since this piece is four and a half inches wide, uh, I will plan on this edge here being waste. So I'll rip it down to two inches for one stick and then um, another two inches for the second stick. And uh, once I do that, I'll come back and I'll talk to you about what my next steps are. So I'm back at the bench having ripped this board into the two blanks that I'll use for the winding sticks. And now I've got some decisions I need to make. Um, as you can see, uh, the spalting uh, on this one part of the board uh, it wasn't completely ripped off. So that's gonna be uh, that's gonna be a feature one way or another, and I need to figure out how how that's gonna be. So I've got to think about how the sticks are going to look visually to the user. So in wood that has figure like this, I want to make sure that the figure doesn't unnecessarily detract or distract from the user when they're sighting over the tops of the, of the two sticks. So that's one consideration. Um, I also just want to take into consideration which side is prettiest. So uh, what this has going for it is it's got some just beautiful both color and curl to it. Um, it does have this spalting down there. So again, uh, I've got to think about, I'm not making these for anybody in particular, so um, if these were a commission piece, I could talk to the buyer and say, hey, um, does this bother you? And then I could go on from there. Uh, but they're not. I'm just making these because it's beautiful wood and I want to make them. Um, so, beautiful color, nice figure over there. So now I can flip them over and take a look over here. And actually... Um, This side, I think, actually might end up being prettier than, than the front side. And that was not my initial suspicion, not my initial thought. 
So, a um, couple things. All of my all my winding sticks are tapered, so I have to take into consideration what's going to be cut away. So, when all is said and done, these will be five eighths of an inch at the bottom and five sixteenths at a top at the top. So, I'm going to be ripping away. It's a little bit crooked, but I'm going to be I'm going to be ripping. A fair amount of this away and actually I just did that backwards whoops um, the 5 sixteenths will be up here and then down there so ignore that line so all of this all of that will be cut away so um, I have decided the orientation, which side I'm going to use. So this will be the, um, these two faces will be the faces of the winding sticks. From there, I need to decide, well, which one am I going to put the long inlay strip in and which, which one am I going to put the two smaller strips or two smaller uh, siding inlays in. And you might think, well, it doesn't really matter. Well, in some cases it doesn't. In some cases the figure of the wood might play into where, which of the two I want to have the long strip versus the two shorter siding inlays. In this case, when I when I look look at the tops of these, the top edges of both of these. I don't think it really makes too much of a difference. I think uh, the figure is similar enough on both of them that um, I can choose either one for the long strip and I'll, uh, and I'll, be, I'll be fine. So with that said, I think what I'm going to do is this one will receive the long siding inlay and I just mark a line there and that's just um, to let me know that that's the one that I've chosen for the long inlay. And then I just put two X's here. And that's just a, a visual reminder that, hey, that's where those siding inlays are going to go. So my next step is to figure out what wood I want to use for the inlays. So... I'm going to go rummage through my inlay stock and I'll be back in just a minute with a couple of options. Okay, I've gathered together a couple of different options that I have available to me for the siding inlays for these Curly Koa winding sticks. And let me just kind of walk you through what my thought process is when I do this. And it, it's really, regardless of what the primary species of wood is, this is my thought process every time. Um, there are two overriding concerns. One is usability. How, how are they going to work for the woodworker when they have these in their hands? Um, and aesthetics. And the two are very, very closely related. Let me explain what I mean by that. So I'm working with a piece of wood that once it has shellac on it, the tone is going to darken and the chatoyance of the curl is really going to pop. So I need to keep that in mind. Um, with that in mind, my first, the first option that I had thought about was English boxwood. What this has going for it uh, is that the color complements the color. That's a good thing. Um, they work well together, but what I'm not so sure about is whether or not the boxwood provides enough of a visual distinction so that when in use, when the woodworker is sighting over the top of these two, um, I, I'm not convinced that the English boxwood provides enough of a visual contrast so that when they're try, trying to line up the tops of these two winding sticks, uh, the distinction between the color of the boxwood 
and that of the curly koa will be um, striking enough, if that makes sense. So I'm going to set the boxwood aside for a second. Next up, I have just a plain piece of maple. Whoops. So what this has going for it that the boxwood doesn't have going for it is there's a very clear visual distinction in terms of the color. Uh, I could... I could go with this maple and be content, but not thrilled. And with this particular wood, I really want to be thrilled with, with how they look and work um, when they're all, when all is said and done. So I'm just not, I'm not convinced that this plain maple has the wow factor that needs to go with this curly koa. That leaves me with tiger maple. Now, the particular stock that, of tiger maple that I've got, um, I've used it enough to know that when, when it receives shellac, I'm just gonna give it a little spritz here, the color of this particular tiger maple, um, the figure and the chatoyants, um, it's, it's got some variations in the color that I think are really nice and complementary to the koa. I think the curl of the tiger maple is also nice and it's, it's not a visual distraction. Um, so, um, given all of these considerations, uh, the boxwood I think is out just because it doesn't provide enough of a visual distinction for the user, that's out. Uh, the plain maple, as I said, I could go with it and be content, but not really happy. And I want to be happy and I want to be thrilled about these. And more to the point, I want whoever ends up owning these and using them to be thrilled with them. And um, I think when all is said and done, I think the tiger maple provides uh, the best visual contrast that is going to provide the best user experience for the woodworker who ends up using these. So decision made, Tiger Maple. So the next step is to go and to cut in the rebate on, on this stick that will receive uh, the, the long siding inlay. So I'm gonna go do that. And then I'm going to come back and show you uh, show you how I go about putting the inlay in. It's not rocket science, but I thought I'd walk you through it. So I'm back at the bench having cut the rebate into this winding stick. And for efficiency uh, purposes, I cut the rebate on the, on the table saw. I have done it by hand with a plow plane. And when I have time, it's, it's a nice thing to do, but um, when I'm making a lot of these, it's just more efficient to do it on the table saw. However, it does, um, even with the, the flat toothed blade, sometimes it leaves some imperfections. So a little bullnose plane like this works just perfectly for trimming up any kind of, whoops trimming up any kind of discrepancies that you might have. All right. So I've got that. I've got my inlay. Now I have tried doing this with clamps when I first started making these. And it was just way more trouble than it was worth uh, with no uh, discernible benefit. Um, speaking of discrepancies, I'm seeing a little bit, a little bit of a problem with this inlay. So this is why you always dry fit first. Um, so I've got a gap 
down here and that's not going to do. So I've got to, I've got to take care of that. So that's going to take some thinking. When it, when the piece is this thin, uh, it's a little bit of a challenge to plane. Um, let's see what I can do. If I can get this into the vise, just a little bit of it. Honestly, I think it's block plane. It's my best bet. So let's see. And that did it. That did it. Okay. So, um, as I was saying, I've tried using clamps when I glue this and painter's tape. It does everything that I need it to do. You don't need a lot of clamping pressure for this. So, uh, I have found that, that painter's tape is, is just the easiest and most efficient way to do this. Um, just double checking all of this to make sure I am in fact happy with this. Yep. That will work. Okay. So... A bit of wood glue, tight bond, and then to give me a little bit of clamping pressure to keep this in place as I'm taping it, I put a couple drops of CA glue all the way along here. Uh, and that acts as just kind of a temporary clamp. stretch and that's all the clamping pressure you need for this to hurry with this. You got enough time, you got enough open time with the, the tight bond. And two areas I want to pay particular attention to are the ends, because if there's any gap on the ends, that will show immediately. I mean, you don't want gaps anywhere, but that's one place where they would be particularly 
stand up like a sore thumb. So I'll leave this overnight and then tomorrow I will get to work on the inlays for its mate. And that's the next, uh, the next part that I'll show you. And that I do all by hand. I cut the, I cut the inlays by hand and then I chisel out the mortises for them by hand. So that's the first part of how I make my winding sticks. I hope you enjoyed this. If you do, or if you did, please click like and subscribe and tell your friends about the channel. I'll see you next time. Thanks.